Let's begin, though, with an urgent call to young Canadians. Canada's chief public health officer, Dr. Theresa Tam, is asking them to not give in to what she calls COVID-19 fatigue. That's in the wake of rising infections across the country, mostly among people ages 20 to 39 today. Ontario, for example, reported nearly double the cases it reported yesterday. It's the largest number of new cases on any single day since late June. Alberta is also seeing sharp increases. The number of active cases there has jumped by more than 400 over the past week. And British Columbia is averaging 30 new cases a day after seeing a stretch of single-digit increases. That's been driven by an outbreak in the Okanagan, which has been linked to some parties around Canada Day. I want to bring in Patty Haidu now to discuss. She's the Federal Minister of Health. Of course, she joins us from Thunder Bay. Hi, Minister Haidu. Good to see you. Hi, Fashi. Nice to hear you. Uh, I want to start with, with that that information that, that we just laid out and a very simple question to you. As Minister of Health, how worried are you at this moment? Uh, listen, I would say fairly worried. Uh, you know, I had a quite the pit in my stomach for most of February, March, April, and it started to subside in May as we started to trend in the right direction. And I'm feeling that same familiar anxiety. And so I would say I share the worry and anxiety of the other medical officers of the medical officers of health from across the country that you referenced in your opening. We spoke with Dr. New, who's, of course, the deputy chief uh, medical officer of the country, the deputy to Dr. Dr. Tam, a few days ago on the show. And he said that at that point, what he was seeing wasn't necessarily out of line with his expectations as they relate to the economy's re reopening. Is this out of line, what you're seeing right now, with what you expected? I think what worries me right now is just the sort of rapid growing of cases in young people, which is an early signal that... Um, you know, we've got uh, increased community spread. And I think when I look at the chart of growth, uh, what we're not seeing is spikes in, um, in, you know, in cases subsiding. What we're seeing is actual a trend line now of growth. And, and that's, not the, that's not a good thing. So what is the plan specifically where young people are concerned? I heard you a little bit earlier in the press conference talk about having to kind of go where they are. We've heard public health officials talk about that as, as well. They're not necessarily, even though a lot of Canadians are watching your press conferences, it's not necessarily people from the ages of, of 20 to 30. What is the government's plan and, and when will it happen? So governments at all levels are working on communicating with a variety of different segments of the population. But what we know is in order to reach youth, we have to be choosing the right channels and using the right messages. And my department right now is refining the messages we've been using with youth to try and get at that uh, quarantine fatigue, that natural desire to want to gather and to want to party, as some people speak about. Uh, you know, I was a young person once as well. Hard to believe, I know, but uh, it, it, I still remember the the, the deep desire to socialize with friends and peers and, and get to know new people. And, and that's the challenge. Uh, we're asking young people to do something that is really quite actually unusual for young people at that time in their lives. From the information that I've gathered listening to various public health officials, it sounds like, yes, it's young people congregating, especially over the past few weeks indoors, that's driving a lot of the uptick in that age group. But it's also according, and I heard Dr. New say this a few days ago as well, it's also them going back to work when maybe they shouldn't be. And I wanted to ask here about your government's role in all of that. A number of these individuals are on financial aid from the government, be it with CERB or student aid. That's all going to come to an end soon. And, and your government has yet to say signal what happens really after CERB or give maybe a specific answer to that question. Does your government have to do that, given that we do know there are young people who feel like they're kind of forced to go to work because they need it, they need to financially? Well, I think we've been clear all along that we're willing and more than willing to support people financially as we get through this crisis together. The CERB is in place, as you know, until the end of August. Uh, we, as you know, part of the restart agreement is ensuring that people have paid sick leave and that will those details will get ironed out with provinces and territories shortly. Uh, I'll just say this, uh, you know, what we do actually know from the data that the, the, the infections are dr being driven largely uh, through uh, 
congregate settings where people are coming together in large groups and yes, in sometimes contained spaces. So I think, you know, we, we've got to be careful with assuming uh, certain things without really understanding the data. And as the data starts to come clear, uh, you know, it is parties and larger congregate groupings of people under 40 or so that are getting together for social reasons. And, and you know, I, again, understand the urge to do that. But I, I also urge all, all Canadians to understand that we're not out of the woods yet and that we really, uh, our recovery is very fragile and the economic recovery is critically linked to our health recovery. I guess I'm referencing the work piece because I did hear it from, I take your point on the data, uh, I did hear it from from a number of public health officials throughout the week at their press conferences. And I'm also hearing it from young people over the past few days who have reached out and feel a bit attacked uh, in a way. And I'm not trying to take away from the message that everyone is trying to send people about getting together in parties and the dangers associated with that. But they felt like, well, hey, it's, it's you know, I, many of us are going to work because we don't know what's happening after the summer. And I take your point on CERB going to the end of August and on sick pay eventually being worked out. But those details aren't ironed out yet. And your government has not indicated what happens at the end of August once CERB runs out. Well, listen, nobody should be going to work when they're sick. And we've said that repeatedly. And people will have support right now from the CERB if they are unable to work for any reason uh, related to COVID, if, if it's a layoff or if they're sick. So that is off the table at the moment. And I will just reiterate it because it's so important. If you're not feeling well, please stay home. Please do not go to work. So uh, in, in that regard, you know, I, I just want to remind all Canadians that that is uh, support that's currently available. And as I said, uh, we're going to make sure that we have supports going forward. We know that we need to continue to support people to do the right thing when they're sick and stay home. That's why 10 paid sick days was part of the package that uh, we negotiated with provinces and territories, the $19 billion restart package. And I know those details will be coming forward soon. We understand that the end of August is a month away, uh, but I will tell you that we won't leave Canadians hanging. And we know that a critical part of making sure that we don't have uncontrolled spread is ensuring that people can stay home when they're sick. I want to ask you about a, a vaccine minister and, and kind of looking ahead. Yesterday we found out, and, and we had Dr. Naylor on the program, the head of the immunity task force, about the results of the first 10,000 serology or antibody tests. And what they showed was that fewer than 1% of Canadians had antibodies present. Dr. Naylor outlined why that makes a vaccine so significant, so important, and it, why it will be so important in the Canadian context, especially. We also learned this week that, uh, you know, there are some major, there's, there is some major progress being made on the research front there, especially out of the UK at Oxford. It looks like AstraZeneca, uh, the sort of company behind that, has now inked a deal with European countries as well as India to supply the vaccine. Does Canada have an explicit deal with any kind of company like that if a vaccine is successful, that it will produce it, produce it for Canadians? As you know, Vashi, I think we took an important step in appointing a vaccine task force of experts in this area to help guide the government of Canada's decisions about where we place our bets in terms of vaccines. It's a highly competitive space, as you know, and there are a number of promising candidates. And Canada continues to work with manufacturers, pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, across the spectrum, guided by the advice of the vaccine task force. I'll also say this, the vaccine, when it arrives, it will be also a process of un unrolling that vaccine across Canada. That in itself is a large challenge that we look forward to the advice of the task force uh, in terms of how we, how we accomplish that task. Yeah, I, have, I actually have a follow-up question on that very subject because Dr. Naylor talked about how there'll be some big decisions about, the, about that rollout coming up. But just on the first part of my question, again, I just want to be explicit so that I understand and our audience understands. Is there any such deal right now? If a vaccine became, uh, you know, was, was deemed uh, useful in six months, does Canada have the ability to access that vaccine? Is there any such agreement in place? Look, again, I wish I could give you the clarity of saying, you know, we've put all our chips on vaccine A or B. I think the approach of Canada is to actually have multiple irons in the fire, if you will. And that's the advice of the vaccine task force. There are promising candidates. There are Canadian candidates. And, you know, uh, and these are negotiations with pharmaceuticals that are ongoing right now based on the advice of the tax task force. And so uh, as soon as there's more to say uh, to Canadians about what specific companies or what specific pharmaceutical 
pharmaceutical companies uh, Canada is investing in and 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 uh, engaging with in terms of of our bets, if you will. Uh, we'll have more to say at that point. But look, these are these are difficult decisions. There's a lot of speculation still about which company is going to have the right uh, the the most effective vaccine, if you will. I mean, this is why the vaccine task force work is so critical because, in fact, we need that expertise and that guidance to make sure that we're making the right decisions as a government. Are we behind the ball, though, at all on, on making those decisions? And, and I asked only because I, it really jumped out at me this week that those countries have already inked a deal. And I know they're making a bet, but if that vaccine is successful, they have 400 million doses of it available to them in Europe. And I have not seen anything like that here. No, we're not behind the ball. And I will say that pharmaceutical companies are making decisions based on a complex number of factors, not just necessarily the investment and the, co the contributions of the, of, the, of the country, but also whether or not there are enough sick people in that country to actually run uh, the kinds of next stage clinical trials that need to happen. And so, again, those conversations are ongoing. We believe that, obviously, we need to proceed with, uh, with speed, but also with some degree of confidence that where we're making the right choices in terms of where we put our resources in terms of the successful candidate vaccines. And so that's why, again, the Vaccine Task Force is playing such a critical role to help guide those decisions. But before you go, Minister, I, I do have a, one final question on a, on a different subject. And, and you spoke today about how you still support uh, Finance Minister Bill Morneau, that, that you still continue to stand by him. And, and this is obviously with respect to the We Charity controversy. I'm wondering if, he, if you really think that he can remain in cabinet, though, after this week. You're here to talk about your government's, obviously, response to the pandemic. But Canadians, because of the actions of the prime minister and the finance minister, are calling into question, really, whether their government is acting in their best interest interests. Is that really well, tenable? I, listen, I, it's not for me to say who should be in cabinet or not. It never has been. That is the decision of the prime minister. I will stand by my statement, which is that Minister Marno's response from an economic and fiscal perspective was critical in ensuring that we had the resources that we needed at the time, including things like the CERB, by the way, to make sure that Canadians could do the right things and help contain the virus in this country. He has been incredibly responsive in this regard. I've worked with him on, with over multiple files and multiple years, and he is extremely skillful as a finance minister. He's an extremely collaborative colleague. So I'll leave it there, but I'll just say that, you know, never is it a colleague's decision about who should be in cabinet that solely rests at the prerogative, uh, with the prerogative of the prime minister. I guess I wonder from your perspective, though, again, as you're here to talk about the government's pandemic response, there are Canadians now wondering if the decisions that your government are, ma are making are in their best interest. And is that tenable to you? Well, actually, and I'm sure there are Canadians that wonder that. I mean, this is a country where there are multiple perspectives. But I'll again point to the outcomes of our work so far. We've got Canadians that are supported fiscally, that are supported from a medical perspective. We've got provinces and territories that have the financial supports they need to continue to manage this pandemic. We've got, you know, hospitals and other facilities across the country that are well connected to the kinds of needs that they they were require as a result of the investments of the federal government. And we've got a lot of progress in terms of science and research that will help us uh, better manage this as we understand more and more about the coronavirus itself. So listen, I, I guess I'll leave it with Canadians to decide uh, and judge, you know, our actions in terms of how well we've done. But it's not the end of the story. And we will continue to be there for Canadians. That's my job as health minister is to continue to work uh, tirelessly to make sure that all across the country, Canadians and provinces and territories and organizations have what they need to respond to this incredible crisis. Okay, Minister, I'll leave it there. I appreciate your time this evening, as always. Thank you, Sashi. Bye-bye. Guys, you, you just, I'm telling you, you, you just can't go to these parties. It's, uh, you're, you're going to go home. It's, it's not little Johnny I'm worried about. It's little Johnny's grandparents I'm worried about. They go see grandma, grandpa, or mom and dad. That, that's, you know, that, that's concerning. Ontario is reporting a dramatic rise in COVID-19 cases. 195 today, nearly double the cases reported yesterday. And Premier Doug Ford is pointing his finger at not only young people, but also migrant workers. The CBC's Megan Fitzpatrick joins us now from Queen's Park in Toronto with more. Hey, Megan, good to see you. Tell us a bit more about the, the latest development here.
Yeah, it was quite a change in tone and messaging from the Premier today, Vashi, saying that he is going to look into making testing of migrant workers mandatory, that he has directed his team to seek legal advice uh, from constitutional experts to see whether this is even possible. Until now, when Ford has been asked about this, he's always said you can't force people to get tests. He's just been urging and encouraging it. Uh, but now he's taking a different uh, tactic and trying to pursue this path anyway seeing if he can and why now it's because the case numbers continue to be so high in the Windsor Essex region and a lot of those cases uh, coming from the farms in that area Windsor Essex now leading the province in terms of new cases uh, Ford was expressing a lot of frustration today over the lack of testing in that region on the farms and well one of his messages was directed at the farm operator saying if you have migrant workers get them tested we'll do whatever we can to help facilitate that that a lot of his frustration was today directed at migrant workers. Take a listen to a little bit of what he said in his remarks. We have to check the constitution. I gotta make sure I go through the uh, lawyers. I have to make sure I call the federal government. Uh, but what's the problem to get a quick test? I've been tested a couple of times. I'm sure everyone around here has been tested and you're coming into our country. You're gonna collect a paycheck. You're giving a great service. And I appreciate the migrant workers, I really do. We're protecting them. If for any reason they're sick, they're gonna get paid. If they were here last year, they're gonna get served. We're gonna make sure we take care of them. We're gonna feed them. We're gonna put them in hotels at our cost. So the least thing you can do is cooperate and get a test because it holds up all of Essex and Windsor. And it's just not fair to the people of Essex and Windsor. You can obviously hear the frustration in his voice there, Vashi, and, and quite strong comments directed to the migrant workers. Uh, in terms of the testing that's going on down there, Ford has said that it's all hands on deck, but yesterday, Dr. David Williams, the chief medical officer, actually said that testing on farms had been paused for the last two weeks uh, because of confusion and miscommunication with the farm operators. Uh, he said the government has now developed some guidance documents uh, for those employers so they know better what to expect if a mobile testing unit comes to their farm and what the impact on their operations might be if there are positive cases. So apparently the testing set to resume if the farm operators ask for it. Yeah, and, and you have been trying to get some reaction to those comments. What did you find? Yeah, so I spoke quickly to the Migrant Workers Alliance for Change, one of the advocacy groups um, that works with these migrant workers. And they're saying it's not the migrant workers that are the problem here, it's the employers. Uh, one of the group's representatives told me a lot of workers want to get tested. They are worried about getting sick with COVID. I should point out three migrant workers, all from Mexico, have died from COVID-19. And so these workers are very afraid for their health, uh, but some of them are telling the group through a hotline uh, that it's their employers that aren't letting them get tested or aren't facilitating it. And then the workers are afraid to speak up uh, because they're afraid of repercussions. So the group is saying if the government really wants to mandate anything, they should mandate physical distancing in the housing accommodations for these workers and in their workplaces, be it in the fields or the greenhouses or whatever the farm operation is. Uh, the group's saying that's not currently mandated and that's partly why COVID-19 is spreading easily through these farms because of the poor living conditions that these workers are having to deal with and they're saying the province has failed to protect these workers and that the federal government should step in. More broadly, Megan, on the spike in cases, we've got a, a medical panel standing by to delve into it, but what is the, the main takeaway beyond what you've just laid out? Main takeaway for cases in Ontario today is again, the growing number of young adults that are getting COVID-19. There were 195 new cases reported today in Ontario and 66% of those cases are people under the age of 40. And that is why you heard the Premier once again, trying to encourage people uh, to stop partying, he says, stop getting together in large groups. They have been saying that these outbreaks uh, and the spread of these cases, not necessarily tied to bars and restaurants, but rather indoor parties. And so so they're, again, encouraging young people to pay attention to the health guidelines, maintain physical distance, uh, because you're not only putting yourself at risk, you're putting older, more vulnerable people at risk as well.
All right. Thanks, Megan. Appreciate all that information. The You're CBC's welcome. Megan Fitzpatrick for us. Ontario, meanwhile, is not alone. Spikes of COVID-19 are being reported across the country. Since July 16th, Canada has seen more than 400 new cases per day. On three occasions, more than 500 new daily cases were reported. Public health officials say young people are driving the increase, as Megan mentioned. So what could that mean for the country's progress? To dig into all of that, I'm joined now by Dr. Michael Warner. He's the medical director of critical care at Michael Guerin Hospital in Toronto. He joins us from that city. And Dr. Zane Chugla, Medical Director of Infection Control at St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. He joins us from Mississauga. Both very familiar faces to our audience. Thanks for being with us tonight, gentlemen. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Dr. Chugla, I'll begin with you just on that reported spike in cases in uh, you know a variety of provinces across the country. I'll pose the same question to you. I did the, the health minister a few minutes ago. How worrying are those numbers? I mean, there's going to be ebbs and flows. We don't have a, a perfect solution for COVID-19. Uh, there's there's no way we can certainly eliminate it from our population. Um, so, you know, numbers are going to go up and down. I think the, the more concerning part of that or the more lesson learned from those numbers is where it's happening. And we're seeing the two major groups, as was mentioned, the one in the migrant workers, particularly in the Windsor-Essex area, and the other in young people in, in the province. And so our, our major strategies now are to target those groups rather than getting concerned and, and, and growing concerned in terms of our phasing up, really looking at those groups seriously and figuring out a way to actually get them tested and, and prevent them from acquiring COVID-19. Dr. Warner, we've checked in with you so frequently during this pandemic to see what it's like actually on the front lines of, of sort of what, it, what the reality of these numbers are. When you hear the increases, A, lately, and B, the, especially the uptick in, in young people in the province and, and across the country, is that what you're seeing? So in the hospital, uh, we actually have no COVID patients at my institution, and we haven't for a couple of weeks. So the uptick in cases has not yet reached the acute care setting, and it may not if uh, more young people are getting this in elderly and, uh, and otherwise vulnerable populations. But it still is vitally important because younger people can infect older people who will then end up in the hospital and potentially uh, in the ICU. We do have adequate resources right now to provide COVID care as needed and also non-COVID-related health care. Dr. Chugla, you, you talked about targeting the specific groups that we're seeing this so evident in. Uh, on the first group, young people, when you talk about targeting them, uh, I, I was saying to the health minister, some are telling me, you know, obviously this is about getting together, but I'm getting a lot of young people writing me saying, you know, I kind of resent that characterization. It's not like I'm out there partying all the time. Lots of times I, I have to go to work and some are, are, you know, we know from public health officials going to work when they're not feeling well because they don't really see an alternative. I'm wondering what you think the uh, effective messaging might be towards that group? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you covered a couple of factors. Yes, there are young people acquiring this in, in get-togethers, but there's also different social structures, different conditions in young people. Many young people live together. They're their, their environment rather than the typical nuclear family we see. So if one of them gets them, multiple get gets COVID-19. Um, I think, you know, there there's a wealth of communications and media folks out there uh, that, that are a part of that messaging and, and really, again, supporting mask use, supporting young people if they do get sick to go get tested and have some economic recovery from it. And really, you know, I, I, I agree with you, you know, the sentiment becomes, you know, you guys should be stopping partying and, and, uh, and you guys shouldn't be getting COVID-19 from these activities it's going to probably discriminate young people against getting tested because when they get contact traced, they're going to then have to admit to, to if they did do those activities that they did those activities. And so I think we really need to have young people, stakeholders, social media stakeholders, media stakeholders to really think about that population and how to really reach them. One, to, to encourage them to get tested, but two, to encourage them to do the day-to-day the -day things that we're doing, and three, to really address the fatigue that they're seeing associated with COVID. Uh, Dr. Warner, I, I want uh, Dr. Chugla mentioned uh, contact tracing, and that's something that we've spoken about before. You had a lot of concerns about the, the system that was in place and how long it was taking, or some of the unnecessary, I think is how you characterize them, delays in, in getting to people once you knew someone, for example, was positive, though the test might not have come back. Has the system, from your vantage point, improved at all? 
I think there have been some improvements. I think fax machines have largely been retired as fundamental to the public health infrastructure. Uh, there's also fewer cases, so it's easier for a limited number of contact tracers to uh, stay ahead of uh, those cases. But as the economy reopens, and particularly as we think about school resuming at some point in time, we need to make sure that contact tracing resources are really bolstered so that we can uh, get ahead of outbreaks before they get out of hand. Uh, it'd be interesting to know if the contact tracing app that was promised on July 2nd will get past beta testing, because that could be a way for the younger generation to take more ownership over uh, their interactions and risk of COVID-19 uh, instead of being vilified, as it sounds like they feel they are being now. I want to pick up on the uh, the schools reopening, Dr. Chugla, and, and in general, I guess, the process of reopening. I think that a lot of people go right away when they see this uptick in numbers and think, do we need to reverse what's being open? Do we need to retighten restrictions? I know from a, you know people who own businesses are, are scared of that possibility, of course, for their livelihood. Everyone's kind of nervous for, for different reasons. Do you think, based on what you're seeing right now, these outbreaks or this uptick in numbers is manageable and the economy can continue the way it is and schools, for example, could could reopen? Like, is there is it within a framework that is manageable? I think so. I mean, again, as I had mentioned, the, the big thing here isn't necessarily numbers. It's where they're coming from and understanding that population. And then, thankfully, in Ontario, we have two major populations that are a source of the the significant amount of the transmission we're seeing in the province, and we have we can generate a plan to target them in that sense. Uh, I think you know we have to be very thoughtful about opening and closing. Uh, as things open up, we have to really monitor those settings where this transmission is occurring. But we do also have to give things a fair chance to say, you know, can they remain open? Is there significant transmission? Is it difficult to deal with uh, in that sense? So I think we're still on track to open schools from this dynamic. Uh, if we were getting a significant number of cases where we had no clue where they were coming from or why they were occurring, then we would be a whole lot more troublesome in opening up in the fall. Dr. Warner, your thoughts on on reopening schools and, and what you are, are hoping to see? Well, I think the, the, the topic of school reopening is probably the most complex undertaking uh, we've had to face in this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, at least in Ontario. It's far more complicated than buying more ventilators and making more ICU doctors. And I think that we need to understand that significant resources will be needed to do this safely. There are many schools that are already overcrowded where there's inadequate ventilation, there are portables without bathrooms, and teachers, parents, and students, I think, are appropriately scared. We have infection prevention and control experts who have helped us in the hospital. In fact, they tell me how to conduct myself that I think should be seconded by the government to walk through schools to figure out what needs to be done in individual schools to make them safe. And if schools can't be made safe, they shouldn't be opened. Just because we understand that school is important for children and kids being in school is important for the economy doesn't mean we should start school in an unsafe way. And I would like to see the government making plans now running pilot projects, et cetera, to see if the machinations of school reopening are actually possible. It involved parents and other domain experts in education uh, in those types of decisions, working with hospital-based experts to come up with solutions that can be adapted for the school environment. I know a lot of parents we hear from a lot are very interested in that topic. Certainly, I, I have to leave it there. I'm out of time, but I thank both of you very much for your time and for your insights. Uh, excellent, as always. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thanks so much to Dr. Zane Chugla and Dr. Michael Warner. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.